Of all the races that captivate Elder Scrolls fans, it is quite often those of ages past who come out on top. We can all fall in love with any of the 10 playable races, but there's just something so alluring about the once burgeoning civilizations that have since been lost to time. Advanced societies like the Snow Elves, the Dwemer, the Yakudans, or in this video today, the Aelids, leave behind some of the most mysterious and intriguing secrets in the Elder Scrolls universe. Similarly to the Dwemer flying too close to the sun in their pursuit of technological prowess, the Aelids who once ruled Cyrodiil in the Morethic Era became too ambitious for their own good. After splitting from the rest of the Oldmer in the Somerset Isles, the Aelids travelled to the Heartland and carved out a massive elven empire, building grand cities and structures all over Cyrodiil, including the one and only White Gold Tower. But unlike the Dwemer, it was not the raw achievement of the Aelids in their pursuit of power that led to their downfall. No, it was their gradual corruption, the degradation of their moral code as they turned their back on their Adric teachings and embraced the Daedra. Like many societies in Tamriel, such as the Dark Elves, enslavement was a key part of growing Aelid civilization. The victims were Cyrodiil's local population of men, the proto-imperial race known as the Needs. The Needs provided great utility to their elven overlords, and over time, even entertainment. The Aelids are said to have had sadistic flesh sculptures, existing purely as a form of torture art. Places known as the Wailing Wheels of Vindarsal and the Gut Gardens of Sursen are just two examples that we know of, and many Aelids did not feel any remorse towards such activities, only excitement, and even a desire to outperform one another's depraved creations. Eventually, the Nidic people would claim back their freedom, overthrowing the elves in a rebellion led by Saint Alicia. Alicia, who was also a slave at the time, had prayed to Akatosh and the Aedra for help, and her calls were answered. The rebellion was joined by Pelinor Whitestrake, a champion of Shazar, or Lorcan, and Morahouse, a demigod manbull, and also Alicia's lover. United against the elves, the Elysians tore down the Aelid kingdoms with vengeance, and it seemed that ultimately the Aedra had turned their back on the elves, siding with the races of men, for the Aelids had forsaken the Aedra's teachings and needed to be punished for their wicked hedonism. However, the Aelids' demise was not immediate. Like the torture they'd inflict on the needs, the end of the Aelids was quick for some, but a gradual burn for others. Some Aelid kings were kept around after deciding to help Empress Alicia, while others fled to different provinces like Valenwood or Skyrim seeking refuge. Many of these fleeing elves were hunted and wiped out, while others are thought to have assimilated into the cultures and bloodlines of other elvish races. Perhaps some Aelid lines remain today, we can't say for sure. The last Aelid king, who originally aided Alicia, eventually had to flee to High Rock, where he became a tactician for many years before his eventual demise. But what if the Aelid's king could return? What if their civilization could somehow rise again? What's going on ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael and today on Fudge Muppet, we'll be exploring the desires of an elf who is so obsessed with the Aelids, you'd think he'd want to be born in the Morethic era. There have been no reported sightings of Aelids in Tamriel for over 1000 years, and if you were to ask citizens living around the heart of their old civilization in the Imperial City, everyone would be absolutely thrilled that this cruel race no longer walks Nern. Well, perhaps all but one individual who goes by the name of Umbukano. This elf is hell-bent on uncovering every single secret there is to know about the Aelids and owning every artifact. Perhaps we should hire him to do research for Fudge Muppet, but a job seems like the last thing he'd need. In the Elder Scrolls for Oblivion, Umbukano resides within the Talos Plaza district of the Imperial City, though I'm sure this hero god of men is not an entity he'd be particularly fond of. Umbukano is quite the admirer of elven society, and isn't afraid to push forth his view that history has been unkind to the Aelids. Victors do write the history books, and if some Aelids were willing to help Alicia, perhaps they weren't all so bad. But how does one gain an audience with this elf in the first place? 
Well, it all begins by stumbling across a rare Aeliad artifact, simply known to us as an Aeliad statue. Depending on your mercantile skill and disposition with a shopkeeper, you can sell this off for a maximum of 250 gold. Given that the artifact has no use to the player, it seems like the obvious thing to do. There's a small collection of these statues scattered across Cyrodiil, hidden deep within dangerous Aeliad ruins. But unless you know that Umbakanu desires these artifacts, you won't be meeting him until his stu- tracks you down. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Jolring. I come on behalf of my master, Umbakano. He asked me to deliver this note. I believe it is an invitation to visit him at his manor in the Imperial City. My master is a collector of alien antiquities. It has come to his attention that you recently sold an item that interests him. I believe the note will give you all the details. When we go there, Zhou Ring will be eager to escort us upstairs. Welcome. My master instructed me to show you up immediately. Please follow me. Entering the upstairs level of Umbakano's house, we finally come face to face with the one and only Aeliad Sympathizer. But what can Umbakano tell us about these unique statues? Thank you for coming. You may recognize that statue over there on the table. The very one that you recently sold for less than its true worth. As you may know, I am somewhat of an enthusiast for Aeliad antiquities. In my own modest way, I have amassed a rather considerable collection. I have recently become interested in obtaining the complete set of these ancient statues. I believe that ten still exist. No mere shopkeeper knows their true worth. If you bring them to me when you find them, I will pay you double for each one. I am looking for the complete set of ten for my collection. They were once part of the Temple of the Ancestors in the ancient Aeliad capital. Through my research, I have learned that they were removed from the temple before its sack by men. I believe they were hidden in various Aeliad settlements across Cyrodiil, although I do not know the exact location of any of them. He does sound a little resentful towards the actions of the Needs against their alien oppressors. Let's sell him the statue for a nice 500 gold and ask him more about the Temple of the Ancestors. You know it as White Gold Tower, the center of the ancient alien capital of Nibine. It was brutally sacked thousands of years ago by humans led by Alessia. The Imperial City is built over the ruins of that ancient city. Before heading off to find the remaining nine statues, it's hard not to notice or snoop around to check out just how lavish this manor is. There's an attic on the very highest level for when Umbukano wants more solitude than he already has upstairs, as well as a massive feast room downstairs. The large sprawling basement and upstairs area both join to each side of the manor, and there's also three hallway rooms, one bedroom for him, one for his steward, and a spare room that seems to be used for storage or for jewelry to do paper work. In addition to his loyal steward, Umbukano has four personal guards. There's the Breton, Matthias Draconis, who you may remember from the Dark Brotherhood plot. There's Umogra Marad, an orc who works the night shift and is married to Gramman, the orc bouncer at the bloated float inn. There's also the Argonian, Ushija, and the Imperial man, Sirius Afranius. You can ask each of them about their situation with Umbukano to get more insight into the elf's wealth and reputation. I got no complaints. Kind of an arrogant bastard, if you get right down to it, but he pays us well enough. I keep an eye on his place. Stuff full of treasure, you know? But no dirty thieves getting in while I'm on duty. I am one of his guard dogs. No more, no less. He pays us well to guard his many treasures. This is enough for me. A bit eccentric. Loves old things. He's practically got a museum upstairs, but... He'd never let anybody else see it. Oh, no. It's odd that they mention treasure and a museum-like setup upstairs because without the Aeliad statue collection, it isn't really that impressive. Then again, perhaps the shelf covered in trinkets is meant to be representative of various antique collectibles. Mbukano also has some rare books about the Aeliads and the time of their downfall. If you're wondering how he affords this luxurious high security setup, perhaps it has something to do with the time he spent in Morrowind. While it's not mentioned in Oblivion, you can actually meet 
defeat Umbukano in The Elder Scrolls 3 within Yasu Mine, alongside the alt known as Sorkalan. Yasu Mine is home to ebony deposits, and is also thought to possess the richest raw glass deposit in Morrowind. Perhaps his presence here hints at how he made so much money, and we can confirm that it's the same Umbukano as he mentions Sorkalan later on in his story arc. The Aelid statues we're seeking have been spread quite far since they were removed from White Gold Tower before it was stormed. The tricky part is that the quest objective doesn't hold your hand and tell you where they are. However, after finding a second statue on your own, Umbukano tells you that he is very pleased and reveals that his research has uncovered the names of five cities where statues may have been taken for safekeeping during the siege. The only modern sites that still bear their ancient names are Moranda, Makamente, Wenyanduik, Ninendava, and Fanakas. The rest of the list, possibly including the two you've already found if you haven't visited any of the locations he gave you, are Kalot, Vilvrin, Welke, Wendelbeck, and Wendy. You'll get a new quest after finding the third statue and then another quest after completing that one, which we'll soon be exploring. However, for the best financial outcome possible, we recommend collecting the full set of statues first. Kalot is a small ruin home to undead abominations like zombies. Funicus is also small but filled with vampires. Macamentane is quite a bit bigger with three distinct zones and necromancers crawling through the entire place. Miranda is of similar size, though it is interestingly overrun with leveled monsters such as ogres, minotaurs, and spriggans. Ninendava is another small ruin with vampires and Vilverin, if you remember correctly, is actually that Aelid ruin you first lay eyes upon when exiting the Imperial sewers at the beginning of the game. Vilverin is a massive and dangerous ruin with four zones, beginning with bandits and then progressing to undead, including a redguard necromancer at the end with his own unique name and backstory. East of Breville, we have the medium-sized ruin, Welke, which is filled with undead and many traps. And we also find Wendelbeck, a huge ruin also filled with undead, powerful necromancers, and more traps. The final two ruins, Wendy and Wenyanderwick, are both filled with undead and have two zones each. The ruins are dotted all over the province, and while they're generally unique in their own ways, you may find yourself wanting to inhale a Vala Stone Kirby style to recharge yourself if you power through 10 a Aelid ruins in a row. Umbukano is obviously incredibly pleased with your persistence. You are doing very well in your treasure hunt, my friend. Only one more statue remains to be discovered. You are very close to earning the reward for completing the set of ten. I urge you to redouble your efforts. You have exceeded my fondest hopes, my friend. The ten ancestors are reunited at last. This is truly an historic day. As I promised when we first met, here is your reward for completing the set. Take it with my sincere thanks. It is well deserved. That's right, Umbukano will give you an extra 5,000 gold on top of the 5,000 you get for finding each statue for 500 each. But things start getting juicy after handing in just the third statue. You have proven yourself more than a simple grave robber. I believe you can handle a more complicated assignment. Excellent. Here, take a look at this sketch. The ancient text referred to this site only as the High Fane. Do you know it? If you have been to the alien ruin known as Malada, you can make the connection yourself, though if not, he won't be shocked. I'm not surprised. I have not been able to find any modern reference to it. Still, the architectural detail is distinctive enough. It may still be recognizable. The High Fane dates from the late Aelid period, following the fall of White Gold Tower, a very troubled time for that ancient people. A time I find most fascinating. The drawing on the bottom of the page I gave you depicts a carved panel from the central chamber of the High Fane. I believe this carving will shed new light on Aelid history. If I am able to examine it closely, I would like you to retrieve it for me. You will need this as well. It is the key to the inner chamber of the High Fane. I part with it reluctantly, so guard it well. It is what began my search for the High Fane many years ago. 
Upon leaving the manor, you're greeted by a competing treasure hunter named Claude Marrick. He asks you to come to the Tiber Septum Hotel across the street for a drink. This Breton rogue has a history of working with Mbacano, and while drinking with you, he can be convinced to tell you about a book that will reveal the location of the High Fane, but also warns you that it will lead you to a truly dangerous place. But perhaps he's just trying to scare you off. Purchasing this rare book known as The Cleansing of the Fane from the Market District, which I'm very surprised Mbacano hasn't tracked down, will lead you to Malada, recognizable due to the shrine-like monument depicted on the sketch. Fighting through this ruin will have you approach a unique looking stone door which the key you were given unlocks, and then you can proceed to grab the special alien carving from the crumbling wall which falls apart in front of you and leaves you to fight an undead boss. After exiting the ruin with the carving however, you meet what could be a bigger threat than the undead you've been slaying, Claude Marrick. Claude and a group of hired thugs have decided to ambush you. Now Elder Scrolls 6 could really take some quest design notes here because there's a lot of options for how this altercation can unfold. I'll also point out that Claude isn't using an invisibility spell in my playthrough, he's just so high level that he has enchanted gear and it has a chameleon effect so he just rolls around like Arbiter with active camo for the whole quest arc. His crew also has leveled gear so if you're a powerful character expect to be fighting against some Daedric armor, but Claude actually offers you the opportunity of giving up the carving, which you can, and they'll leave peacefully. You can still proceed with Umbakanu's final quest, but you'll miss this reward. If you say no and keep the carving, his group will attack you and he'll flee on a horse. Alternatively, you can actually find his thug companions camping to the west of Malada waiting for you to enter. If you kill them, Claude won't even show up for the ambush. If you try to talk to them, they'll lie about why they're there, but the Khajiit of the group, Srazir, is more diplomatic. He believes that Marek is cheating him, and agrees to help you against Marek if you give him half of what you're getting paid. You won't regret it. This one will keep his eyes open, and wait for an opportunity to help you. Don't screw this one though. After the dust settles, look for Srazir in the Tiber Septim Inn in the Imperial City. Full payment is expected. You are honorable, unlike that Renrich Marek. May the moons never shine upon his path. This one will not forget. If you don't uphold your end of the deal, Srazir will stalk you until you leave the city and then attack. Cutting this deal probably isn't worth it if you're a competent fighter, but it's still really cool that it's possible. He'll show up to the ambush and start attacking the other two thugs. One of them, named Rigmore, also has a note from Marek that mentions Srazir seems twitchier than usual and might have realized he isn't getting a full cut. On top of all of this, Claude can actually accept a yield and just let you keep the carving if you raised his disposition enough before, perhaps in the hotel. Upon doing so, his thugs will turn on Srazir, slaying him then and there. Let's return to Umbukano with the carving, which he claims is invaluable in his research on the late alien period. From here, things escalate far beyond what you might expect, with a new opportunity. This is not quite in your usual line of work, but I hope you can help me just the same. A rival collector has an item which I very much want to add to my collection, but she stubbornly refuses to consider any of my offers. She and I have had our differences over the years, I admit. Now she is taking this opportunity to get her revenge. I believe that you may be able to persuade her to part with the item, where I cannot due to her prejudice against me. Are you interested? Her name is Herminia Sinner. She lives here in the Imperial City, in the Elven Gardens District. She fancies herself a student of the Elliots, although she sadly lacks any aesthetic instinct whatsoever. Be that as it may, she has come into possession of an ancient relic known as the Crown of the Elliots. Your job is to acquire it for me. Here is more than enough gold to buy it at any reasonable price. You may keep whatever you do not use as your fee. Reputedly the crown worn by the last king of the Aeliads. It deserves to be part of my collection. Very little is known of him, not even his name. He ruled the last Aeliad city in Cyrodiil during the First Era, three centuries after the fall of White Gold Tower. 
Finding Herminia Sinner in the Imperial City, she's certainly not willing to part with her crown. She knows Mbukano sent us, and will tell you that she suspects Mbukano has questionable intentions. If you think me defenseless, you may be surprised. I'm more dangerous than I look. Perhaps you could overpower me and take the crown? Perhaps. But I urge you to reconsider. In the wrong hands, the crown of the Aliens could be very dangerous. And Umbakano is definitely the wrong hands. His interest in the Aliens is not that of a mere scholar. He hopes to unlock the secrets of their magical power. And if you know anything about Aeliad ruled Cyrodiil, that should make you very uneasy. How is the Aeliad crown dangerous? I'm afraid I don't know for sure. I wish I had a more persuasive answer, but hear me out. The crown of the Aeliads which Umbakano wants is not simply an ancient work of art. It has certain superficial magic powers, true, but its real power is hidden. However, my studies of the ancient text make clear that it is the key to dangerous magical powers which should be left dormant. Umbakano will not give up. You're right. Even if I persuade you, he'll send someone else. Someone less amenable to reason. But what if... What if you brought him another Aeliad crown? My own research into the late Aeliad period suggests that there was not a single Aeliad ruler, but many. They were a bitterly divided people, with many warlords vying against each other for power. Their ultimate demise was wrought by their own civil strife, at least as much as by the rebellion of their human slaves. My crown, the one Umbakano covets, belonged to the ruler of Nenalata. I've learned of another crown, entombed with the last ruler of the rival city of Lindai. Since Umbakano has never laid eyes on the real crown of the Aeliads, I doubt he could tell the difference. In any case, the other is also a real Aeliad crown, just not the right one. I think we could all sleep better if you brought him Lindai's crown instead of the crown of Nenalata. Here, I happen to have the key you'll need to enter the royal burial chamber in Lindai. I hope you'll make the right choice. It's at least worth a try. I know I don't want to find out what terrible power Umbakano could unleash using the crown of Nenalat. We can also ask Herminia about the last Aeliad King, to which she explains that there was not a single Aeliad King, but rather many. Each city-state had its own king, and the Aeliad people in general were very divided. The last Aeliad King, the King of Nenalata, is simply one who remained centuries after the rest had been destroyed or driven out of Cyrodiil. Despite Umbakanu's bad opinion of her, she comes across to me as more knowledgeable than him on the topic of Aeliads, even possessing a copy of the book The Cleansing of the Fane, that Umbakanu didn't seem to know about. You can find that inside her house, as well as some cool Aeliad paraphernalia, and of course the crown Umbakanu wants when you go and rob her blind. There's just no way to convince her to sell it to you. At its strongest variant, the Crown of Nenalata fortifies both Alteration and Conjuration by 15 points and has a 25% chance to reflect a spell back at an attacker, but I just can't help but feel guilty taking this from her. Herminia even has dialogue once you've stolen it, implying that she knows you must be behind it, but still pushes you towards the Crown of Lindai option instead, giving you the key and not saying a word about trying to get her stolen crown back. If you delve through Lindai to get the crown, you'll find it's maxed out effects to be Fortify Alteration and Illusion by 15 points and 35% Resist Magic. Different specialties for different kings, I suppose. If given the crown of Lindai, Umbakano will mention that the Royal Glyph does not appear how his fellow Ultima Sorklin from Morrowind described it. That said, he'll be just as excited either way. To think that I hold the very crown that once graced the brow of the last Aeliad King. Even to gaze upon it would have been death to any one of the lesser races in the old days. I thank you again for your efforts. I have one final task for you, if you are still willing to face danger on my behalf. In order to bring my research on the last King of the Aliens to its final stage, I need to go to the throne room of Nenalata. While I am not without means of defending myself, I believe you would be an invaluable companion on such an expedition. Your reward 
will be whatever plunder you wish to carry off from Nanalata. Since the throne room has been sealed since the time of the aliens, it should provide rich pickings. Very well. Three days, then. Don't be late. Now we've got to get Umbakan into the throne room in one piece. Claude Marek also makes an appearance and tags along, who Umbakano has urged you to remain professional with. Making your way through undead abominations, you finally get to the throne room, where Umbakano can reveal his true plans, his true desire to revive the long dead alien civilization. This is it, just as Sorkalin described it. Follow me. Of Ariel, ye Tamriel, Delavoy, and Arpin Arantanabai. This phrase translates to something along the lines of Of Oriel and Tamriel grant the noble king passage. In his manic excitement, Umbakanu will approach the throne to fulfill what he refers to as the glorious rebirth of alien civilization. Here it is. The throne of the last king of the Aliens, and so it falls to me to begin the restoration of our ancient glory. Of Suna Tamriel, Octavoy, and Apen Aran Malaboro. This elven phrase roughly translates to In Blessed Tamriel, acknowledge the noble king in your loving vassalage. Here's where things go drastically differently for Mbukanu depending on what crown you gave him. If it was the crown of Lindai, it seems the magic within the throne room deems him as an imposter, or simply not fit to call on the powers of Nenalata. Or maybe it just doesn't have protective qualities that the other crown does. He will be blasted to death by magic from all directions, the crown will be destroyed, and various undead will spring out from behind the walls to attack you and Claude, who won't actually be hostile to you after the quest is done, if you are wondering. He is simply a cutthroat treasure hunter and doesn't seem to hold any grudges. It's all business for him. More interestingly, however, is what happens when you gave Umbukano the correct crown. Arise, my people! The restoration of Tamriel begins today! Umbukano calls the undead to his aid, and it seems he truly wants to bring Cyrodiil, if not all of Tamriel, under alien control, though I'm not sure how this would be possible, even if he did gain some new powers. It's not like he's ascending to a god-tier state. The script for the actual quest turns him into a stage 4 vampire, and gives him a 100% weakness to normal weapons. After killing Umbukano and the undead, you can take the crown and leave the ruin. The residents of Umbukano Manor will mention not having seen him in a while. My master has not returned from his expedition to Nanalata. I fear the worst, but Umbakano Manor remains in my charge, and I will keep it in readiness for his return. The orc guard who works the night shift can even admit to occasionally sneaking out for a drink during her shift, and you can actually go and drink with her. All in all, it wraps up a nicely created quest arc in Oblivion, one that gives the players different ways to approach the quest at various stages along the way. Umbakano is a perfect example of what went wrong with Aelid Civilization. He is a power-hungry elf craving domination of the world around him, willing to go to dark means to achieve his goals. Whether Umbakano was possessed by the last king of Nanalata, or whether the ancient magic within the throne room simply recognized the crown and imbued him with special powers of his own is hard to say. While he turned to a vampire, we can't know for sure if this was just a game design decision or intentional. Interestingly, Molag Bao is one of the Daedric princes the Aelids became involved with, and he is the father of vampires too, being credited with the creation of the vampirism affliction itself. Umbakano will never live to see the aliens rise again, nor does he seem to have ever learnt of the truth behind the King of Nenalata. For starters, the King of Nenalata was not fond of Molag Bao, and disagreed with the cruel ways of the alien kingdoms. Historical records get lost to time, making research more difficult, and of course there's the out of game fact that some of the lore I'm about to cover wasn't invented until the Elder Scrolls Online came out. But in it, you can actually meet the last King of the Aelids in Cold Harbor. His name is Laloriaran Dinar, and he would despise Umbakano for his wild power fantasies. When you meet him, Dinar has been trapped in Cold Harbor for over 3,000 years. But how did he get there? Well, during the early stages of the Elysian Empire, he actually decided to help the Elysian cause. 
his kingdom of Nenalata was spared and incorporated as a vassal city-state. Eventually, Nenalata became the last of the vassal states, and he and his people were forced to leave Cyrodiil, fleeing from the alien-targeted slaughters. He built a new city with his followers in High Rock, before running into trouble with a cult of Hermaeus Mora, who forced him to flee his new city with his family and go to Balfiera. Here he took refuge with the Dereni, becoming a useful tactician in their army. When the Elysian Order invaded the province, Dinar helped the Dereni deal a devastating blow to the Elysians at the Battle of Glenumbra Moors, one of the several military defeats the Elysians struggled to recover from. Depending on whether you believe his and other characters' dialogue or his notes, Dinar either went back to Nanalata in the later years of the 5th century in the First Era, where he was lured and captured by Molag Bal, or he was actually in the Hollow City, which used to be a location dedicated to Meridia, who Dinar serves, which was then pushed into Cold Harbor by Meridia in an attempt to stab a dagger in Molag Bal's side. Ultimately, you help to free Dinar and stop Molag Bal's plane meld, though Dinar is dealt a fatal blow in the process. If you ask Dinar about his people, he will tell you that he saw their rise and fall, and that they were cruel tyrants and conquerors, who believed themselves to be better than the other races of Nern. He says, When the lesser races decided we were the enemy, and united against us, our downfall was all but guaranteed. We were too stubborn to see where we were wrong. He also says, there is a reason I am the last king of the Aelids. I stood alongside the younger races, aided them. I believed in what they fought for. In death, he is pleased to know that the final day of the Aelid people was spent saving Nern from the clutches of Molag Bal. Umbukano appears to be the opposite of what Dinar stood for, and I don't think the two elves would get on very well at all. I think we can all agree that it's probably best that Umbukano failed in his aims to revive the Aelids, and that this long-lost elven society remains a fascinating part of history to learn about, but not part of the present. Thank you so much for watching this video all the way through. I really appreciate all your support, and that there's people who love this stuff, particularly Oblivion, as much as I do. Social media links are down below. My name is Michael, and I look forward to nerding out with you again very soon.